uh, groups uh, here in the UK and does a lot of work, I think, with, with uh, if, if not Wikimedia, the organization and the institution, but certainly with Wikipedia, uh, there's a lot of commonality of interest. And I think that's one of the things that you notice in this space is that um, we have very, I, I know that the description of this is liquid lobbying, but we have very liquid institutions. People can move very seamlessly from one to the other, um, and um, all of us have a bundle of titles. Um, I know that you know everybody gets to say that they're a Wikipedia editor. Um, I am, I think, uh, for a joke, I want to put myself on the IMDB as audience participant, because I've actually been to see the show, and there I am in Boston. But we all have a list of those, those abilities and those roles. The question is, is how do you apply those roles when you're lobbying, when, when you go and see uh, either your political representative or you talk to the, the, the bureaucracy, essentially, because one of the things that I think we, we sort of expanded upon is that most decisions that we collectively are interested in are simultaneously political decisions, but they're also bureaucratic and technological decisions. Right? You're often equally talking to the hired experts that the political system uh, picks up to make these decisions and uh, package these decisions in the way that the political system can understand. Now, I think you have a, a couple of advantages in this sort of situation um, and a couple of disadvantages. Um, one of the primary disadvantages, funnily enough, um, that I think as, as a collective group we often have is it, it, simply numbers. I think this is changing over time, um, but it was certainly true for the last sort of decade, two decades, that you had a sort of group of people who really understood um, what was going to happen in the future. You know, in 2000, 2001, um, or even the 90s, there was a relatively small number of people who understood the challenges that copyright as a, as a system was going to have um, in coming to terms with how the internet was going to work and how the media was going to operate and how the dissemination of knowledge was going to require a rethink about these things. Now, if you'd had a referendum at that point, I think that that group of people would have resolutely lost because if only a very small number of people understood those implications. And I think that while now, as the, the ramifications of that sort of role true, more and more people understand that, for instance, Wikipedia is something that they all want to defend because they all use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's still often very hard to get the numbers up when you're trying to think about the future. So that's one of the primary problems. You're not going to be able to form necessarily a, a, a large political party from the values that you hold in, um, <laughs> unless decide that that's a thing to do. Um, the, the, the big advantage, though, you have is that knowledge and the ability to, to present that knowledge um, in a way that other people can understand. You have the sort of enthusiasm to pursue that kind of knowledge. And then as time progresses, you get kind of a role you can use as well in the, you know, you can turn up to your um, member of parliament surgery or MEP surgery and go, well, I wouldn't suggest going up and going, I'm a Wikipedia editor, because judging from the IP numbers that people are using or, um, from, from Parliament at the moment, he might just go, she might just come back and say, well, I'm an editor of Wikipedia too. <laughs> but um, uh, what you can do is you can represent yourself as an expert and you can present that information. So you have a role that's understood by the political system, and you have a number of roles. You I think one of the things we'll discuss uh, is kind of which hat you decide to wear. I know, you know a lot of people seamlessly moved in the software patent side from being open source developer to small business operator. Uh, and, and whichever of those roles you picked was basically whatever the person you were talking to was going to understand as important. Uh, what this also means is, is that sometimes there's an advantage to being a bunch of individuals that, that there isn't to being a sort of collective force. Um, when Wikipedia speaks or the Wikimedia organization speaks, that's like one little notch 
And whoever is absorbing this kind of information is going, okay, Wikimedia stands here, or the Wikipedia Foundation stands here, or whatever. Um, uh, if you have 200, 300 people turn up to an MP's constituency or in Brussels, and they say, well, we're all representatives of people who use the internet very strongly for our business or for how we organize ourselves, then suddenly you become a much wider and diverse set of opinions. And that makes it uh, an interesting challenge for that organization, for that political entity to try and count. Right? Do you do you register as the international global union of people who use Firefox, um, or are you a, a, a bunch of separate people with similar but diverse interests who have all agreed to have the same thing? That thing. And so I think for the purposes of genuine lobbying, in the sense of the way that the political system is supposed to work, I think that. The making, trying to come to that kind of calculus is important as well. Not only what hat do you wear, but when do you choose to speak up as one voice, and when do you choose to speak up as, as, a, as part of a, a wider collective or a wider group of people. So I'm just sort of saying this as kind of a framing thing without actually giving any answers, um, uh, which I can obviously give answers as well. I have some written down here. But, um, uh, but, but I think that's, that's an interesting way of thinking it's definitely something that I think all of us, as organizations uh, who have very strongly minded members or participants, um, think about all the time. Is it better for us to speak with one voice in a single unity, or is it better for us to you know, split up because we'll cover more ground that way? Can, can I ask you a follow-up question? Sort of yeah. last point? Sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think one of the interesting challenges that we face uh, as a movement is that many of the laws we're dealing with are on, you know, a national level, right? Like Dimi was talking in the previous talk about the great diversity of freedom of panorama issues across, you know, simply across Europe, forget the rest of the world. And I'm wondering, uh, I, you know, as the international director of the EFF, how do you folks deal with that? splintering of attention and splintering of, of energy and effort. I, I don't see it as a splintering at all. I see it as, you know, uh, oh, I suddenly realized that I have to choose, choose here between something that Lenin said or something that Mao said. <laughs> so I, I, I'm only going to say that a thousand, like, digital rights organizations blew or all power to the Soviets and neither of those things that I was I mean, but, 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 but the, the point here is, is that I don't see it as a splintering of attention to have groups in each country tackling those things. Oh yeah, I mean, that, that's not what I meant. I meant more like how do you coordinate, you know, in your own sense, you presumably talk to at least some of those thousand flowers every once in a while. Uh, you know, you water or garden some of them, but you probably don't, you know, probably not all, I would assume. I mean, I know you're superhuman, but there's only so much. And how, how do you kind of do that prioritization within your organization? Um, so I don't think it's a matter of gardening. I think it's a matter of peers working together. I think that, that often, I mean, the, the funny thing is, is that EFF as an institution sort of rides on the back of the United States being such a powerful sort of media force. So we, we, we get a lot of coverage, and, um, and, and we were sort of historically, you know, one of the older ones, but not the oldest. Um, you know, CCC, the uh, Chaos Computer Club, was around long before we were. And, um, and so, for, for me, I, what I see this is a sort of coordination of, of peers. And, and, and the important question you have is like, at what level do you communicate with other institutions and other individuals? Like, there's no point in, for instance, um, um, the EFF talking to, as an institution to every single member of, say, um, uh, uh, the Open Rights Group. So, yeah? yeah so not in my capacity as now at the Media Foundation, but prior to joining the foundation, I was advocacy director for another digital rights group uh, called Access. And we encountered some of these 
important is to ensure you know, that we have a coherent message, you know, that we have different parts of the movement saying practically incompatible. <laughs> <laughs> From a communications perspective. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. I was sitting with some lawyers last night that were telling me advocacy is all just about the law. Uh, no, from a communications <laughs> perspective, it's, it's me. <laughs> it wasn't you. Okay. <laughs> uh, it wasn't last night either. But um, I, I mean, I think it's I think it's important. I think it's incredibly important to know what it is that we want to accomplish um, as uh, you know as a movement. But recognizing, as I said, that it's going to be always different the ways that we go about trying to accomplish that. And you know, we have a pretty good baseline framework for what we know our values are, which in this room are open, is open knowledge, right? Now, if we can disagree along the margins on a lot of those things, and I think that that's where venues like this are so important, is to come together and have a conversation around how exactly we work those through. Um, you know, we don't have advocacy arms that any of what, the, the Brussels chapter, is that it? Is that it has an advocacy here? Germany. Oh, Germany. Germany. The German well, chapter. It's, it's a coordinated a effort coordinated of all effort. European chapters. Oh. Uh, let's be politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Germany. I didn't mean to understand. Good job. It's so European of you. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, given, given the limited resources that we've even put into advocacy uh, up until this point, I think that we're actually exactly where we need to be in terms of that conversation, which is to say, just at the very beginning. And it's going to take us a while to coalesce around that. The movement that Danny, uh, the organization Danny works for, and the movement that EFF is a part of, and that I think that it's, it's a very porous movement, we have a lot of movement back and forth across those, that's a fairly old movement at this point. You guys are how old now, EFF? Uh, 20. Yeah, so it's actually older than the World Wide Web. Oh, no. It's it's older than, uh, than at least our youngest employee. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's a very, very mature movement, and I think we are significantly younger by comparison, even though the principles that we're founded around, and I think um, are much older than, than the movement itself, we're still quite young. So now, for that, now for that, I have to run to my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I will be back in half an hour. Thank you. All right, thanks. We'll be back soon. <laughs> So, so I think one of the things you have to consider about this, because I think you know, digging down, what this is slightly about is like, what do we do with things that we disagree about? Like, what do we do when we want to come forth with a, a, a coordinated position, but there are li lots of little things that we don't we don't want to talk about, or we do want to talk about, we want to talk about endlessly, but we're not going to agree on. And I think what you have to consider is, you know, what are the penalties about not covering those things? Um, and uh, um, if this was a traditional organization, the penalties would be quite harsh because this would be the major way in which you imposed your own beliefs into the rest of the world. Um, but uh, as Catherine said, you know, all of our institutions are pretty porous. And so what we frequently found is if there is a situation where people disagree, then we just fork up a new organization, right? We just we just clone and um, and we set something else up to represent that new opinion. And you're very rarely in conflict with the other organization. Um, and people can work within both of those those settings. Um, and, um, and, and and you can cooperate, cooperate, or you can choose not to cooperate as, as things go forward. Um, just to give it some maybe something more um, concrete, and we have some people from European chapters here who have been active in, in, in policy. Um, so our, our advocacy activities started first on a national level, and then we realized we need to cooperate internationally. So maybe if the, um, Jan and Andre could tell us um, a little bit about what uh, Germany and Italy have been doing in the past on advocacy and how they, they saw the need arise to do, to do things on a, on a more global level. And, and can I add a supplemental question to that, which is that I would love to hear a little bit about your history, how your chapter started in particular to, to get involved yes. in this, and what would have been helpful at that time, right, from either from your community, from other organizations, you know, what, what would have been good to have? What would you wish you had done then? Yeah, thank you. I've been asking Bob. That's our job to speak of the Danny, like speaking of the war veteran or something. <laughs> <laughs> Even older. <laughs> and I think it's uh, it's exactly made the best uh, thing we can do now to, to, to draw a bigger picture to, to have the chapter perspective to uh, to look uh, to have the risk uh, retrospective on how we can 
Wikipedia in the, with the uh, Creative Commons CC by SA license. The problem for Italy is that this thing is not legal. Okay? So we have this uh, uh, amazing law that I think is just comparable to a Myanmar law, uh, which uh, just doesn't allow us to uh, release a picture of uh, cultural heritage on a uh, Creative Commons uh, by SA license because we cannot give to third parties uh, the right to uh, have commercial purpose. It's, we cannot allow others to have commercial purpose. And um, so this is a problem. And um, so. Is that uh, only for copyrighted stuff? Is it still copyrighted stuff? Or no, it's the, no, this is a law of copyright. I mean, when, you know, Italy has, you know, many monuments and they are old. <laughs> And so it's not covered. I mean, we have 1,000 years old churches that I, you know, there is no copyright there, but the, the, the state the, the can, has, has a sort of super rights that says, I can, you, you have to ask my permission. The problem is that you have to, to ask permission from the owner of, of, of the monument. And uh, of course, these rights are scattered and are different for every monument. So uh, when we started, uh, when we tried to organize the Wittlos monuments in 2010, we understood this thing and we didn't organize that. It was too complex, we, we, we didn't reach uh, a sort of, we, we didn't start. In 2011, we prepared for one year before, and so we hired a project manager and uh, we hired and not an, uh, a lawyer just to talk with the ministry. Uh, and then, so we, we, from one end, we, we started asking uh, every, for, a, for each monument the permission. So, okay, I go to this church, I, I talk to the priest, who owns this monument, and I ask him the permission. This thing we have done at the municipality level, the private level, the regional level, and you know, as, as you can understand, it's hundreds and thousands of emails and phone calls and stuff like that. But this is not advocacy. The advocacy part was uh, trying to talk to the ministry and talk some sense into it. And uh, we didn't actually do that. I mean, uh, we changed three um, cultural heritage ministers in two years. Three in two years. So every time was, you know, just uh, re rebuilding the relationship and stuff like that. And uh, the only thing we, we, we could reach was a sort of collaboration, a written collaboration saying, yeah, we kind of like this thing, uh, you can do that. So we say, yeah, and we try to put this new, brand new template on Commons and say, this is CC BY, but you can use that. So, but and actually, at least in, 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 in from, from the copyright point of view, this is okay, and these pictures are on Commons. So at least that was, uh, you know, our primary goal. Um, so, you know, about lobby, we tried several times each year, it's three years that we are trying to talk with the ministry and about changing the law. And we failed, I mean, I, I'm not here to say, e yes, I'm here to, to, to speak to you and uh, to explain to you how to lobby because we don't know, know how to really have success in this. And the, the, the thing that we understood is that uh, we cannot do this alone. The first only very, very trivial thing, we cannot do this alone. At least this process has built, uh, uh, has built a, a sort of community and then working with other arts, with other NGOs, with other associations. And you know, this relentless you know, discussing uh, of, uh, of this, the problem of this law and um, we actually reached out uh, some uh, members of the parliament and uh, tried to explain to them this problem because of course nobody knows that i mean we are the only one who understood that this was a problem and we we were the only one who actually tried to, to be legal and uh, to, to not you know um, break the law and put things on commons without the ministry knowing and um, so we uh, we started doing that. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the cultural heritage law already changed. We proposed several versions of the law, at least some amendments, but we could not, you know, 
put that into, into practice. And what what would we like? Of course, we we are really we are really happy about you know this kind of uh, interchapter collaboration, which is for example Dimi's work. And I would love to have you know ten more Dimi's in Brussels, you know working and working and, and lobbying about uh, the, the topics that we love: the privacy, open access, uh, copyright, and. Um, one of the things uh, I want to say, uh, the, the only thing we, we did was taking some, you know, new parliament members from Italy and take the, the emails and give it to Dini and so they, they can talk. <laughs> but we did, at least, you know, this, this was a small step and uh, we, we did that. And what, what I understood, you know, in talking with other organizations, other people involved in the things, in the topics that we love, is that uh, we are the good ones. I mean, Wikimedia, we are the good ones. Or at least we are perceived as the good ones. So thus we must be the good ones. <laughs> so it's 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 a matter, you know, this is actually a very big topic. It's a matter of working better between chapters, working better chapters and foundation. And uh, if, but I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, we are the fifth you know, website in the world and people say, okay, you are Wikipedia. Only, uh, only we know that Wikipedia doesn't exist and it's just a, a bunch of people creating knowledge uh, on a website, but people perceive us as Wikipedia. One of, we understood that very clearly uh, two years ago when uh, there was the first Italian strike of the Wikipedia. <coughs> There was this uh, another bad law, you know, of course, as usual. And in Italy, that that said, um, you know, was a very bad privacy law. And uh, so the, the community uh, decided to have a Wikipedia strike. It was the first Wikipedia strike that was replicated with so many people. And uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, friends of us. To, you know, we, have, we received phone calls telling me, oh, my, my child came back to school, he was crying, saying, you know, somebody broke Wikipedia, it's closed, I cannot do my homework. People were, people were in pain about that. And so we understood that, you know, we are really important. And uh, we also, in other NGOs, other no-profits organizations, we are perceived as a community working, which is, you know, insane. They think that we are working, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, you know, it's good. Uh, so I think that uh, we, we 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 must be aware of that. You know, clearly uh, and practically aware of that, and so you know, behave uh, as we were the good ones have the best privacy policy, engage with open access and open access literature and all the topics, uh, reform of copyright. We must be the good ones. So we, uh, people really like to have our brand in, in, in good, I mean, there are good projects out there and people really love to ask for our partnership just because it's the Wikimedia logo and the Wikimedia face. And uh, they are asking more and more, of course, this will be, will, will, will mean uh, control and all these projects and uh, review them and audit those. But I think it's really important to understand that uh, we can be a sort of a hub of good projects out there, of good talking, of uh, important, you know, lobbying and advocacy for, for important topics. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what would you say were the lessons from this uh, trying to law to change the law uh, that was happening? the lessons? Well, uh, as I said before, we are at the very beginning. I mean, we, we are growing as a chapter, we are growing as an organization. Uh, the lesson is to lobby harder. I mean, uh, the lesson is uh, be stronger, be more prepared. Uh, we, we must go there with clearer ideas and you know stronger voices. We, we must be there in the parliament with, with people that we know already and with members of the parliament that know this stuff. And this is the best thing we can do at least. Uh, we did not, we did that with, with, within our own capacity. We can do that better. In the end, 
I don't know if we will eventually change the law. You know, it's actually not my responsibility. It's, it's the responsibility of the parliament, and they are doing a lot more awful stuff right now. So at least, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the lesson is uh, you know talk with the with, with the older guys, you know, the, the stronger guys, and try to talk them into these topics. Uh, yeah. Sometimes in the process of legislation, uh, it's, it's crucial to change just one single word. It can make a huge difference. And in, in order to, uh, to conceive this, um, you, you need to follow the, the, the basic, the golden rule of lobbying, which is make friends before you need them. And I think, I think the whole Wikimedia movement lacks closing the gap towards political parties which are from the tendency on the other side. Let's say conservative parties, which traditionally are not so interested in uh, IP questions and um, uh, don't have the uh, good relations, stable relationships to the NGO sector and stuff. So this is something I think um, uh, from your experience as well that you might address the other ones as well, but okay, someday they will be really useful for you. Yes. yes. So, um, so, yeah, apparently I'm the old war veteran, so I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to play that role. So, no, actually, thinking about it in those terms, I mean, I see a lot of things coming to fruition now that have the seeds planted 10 or 15 years ago. And I remember being around 10 years going, this is never going to work. Um, and it's fascinating to watch that play out. So a couple of examples is just the entire reframing of the copyright debate. Um, in the mid-90s, the idea that, that you could argue for uh, a relaxed um, copyright, that you could argue for fair use, uh, and, and these ideas as positive values. Was, was an amazing transformation. It took a lot of time to embed that into people's, into people's minds. The other thing that I noticed is that, and this is absolutely true, that, that this, this idea of reaching out to people um, uh, before the, the clinch comes. And, and I think, honestly, one of the things that it always feels a little hard to do that with that is that these are people in power. And people in power have a lot of devices around them to prevent you from getting to them. Um, because, because there are a lot of people who want to get their attention. And the solution for that turns out to be, we'll talk to them before the, the people in power. Um, uh, EFF is a legal intern um, uh, uh, process, so you can come and, and, um, and work with us, our lawyers. Um, and what's been really interesting about that is watching people come into an intern process, and then 10 years later, 20 years later, they're really important thinkers in that space. Just having a summer with you, um, uh, thinking about these things and taking uh, the, those sort of ideas onwards is, is, has been incredibly important for EFF within the United States. Um, so I would say that there are a lot of young politicians and young, uh, uh, young um, uh, uh, people involved in the political system that it's really worth going out and meet and talking to because right now they're very interested in understanding how the world that they expect to grow up in and work within um, works. And you're one of those people who understands how a very important component of the future actually works. And they will want to talk to you. Let me chime in a little bit here. Uh, you know, the relationship thing, uh, the relationship question gets so close to home for me at the foundation. Um, because we are such a hard organization to, to, to develop relationships with, right? Not, not we in the foundation, but the movement as a whole, right? Um, and so what I find is a frequent role that we play is somebody says, well, we would like to work with Wikipedia, <laughs> and they have, and, but we don't really know what Wikipedia is, right? <laughs> and so they end up uh, calling us at the foundation, right? And um, sometimes we have answers, and sometimes we have to, you know, do the call out to, well, we're not, you know, we're we're mostly here. Let me put you in touch with Jan, or let me put you in touch with Matthias, or um, and we're that informational clearinghouse, and they say, um, 
it's a sometimes frustrating role to play, right? Um, I, I've had this discussion with many EFF employees uh, in particular, where uh, for very good reasons, reasons that I mean, look, I'm a card sharing EFF member, right? So it pains me to say no to EFF when, when they come to me. Um, so one of the things that we've been trying to develop uh, is a bit more of a strategy of how do we handle that? How do we inform, how do we teach a advocate to a little bit about who we are and how we work? And also, how do we provide them with answers that are short of uh, blackout in sight? Right? Because that's sort of the, the, the it is, you know, many, I think the advocates are becoming more realistic. They realize as, as the time gets longer between SOPA and the present, that, oh, that's not something they're going to do every day, right? Um, which if we, at least for a little while, if we had done it every time we were asking, we would, there would be no sight, right? We would always be dark for somebody. And um, so we're trying to, uh, I don't know, Dimi, do you want to bring up the page, the, the contacts, uh, contact page? Uh, or, or the, I forget what the name of it is. Uh, What's the name? I was just saying, the, well, go, I think it's linked to from the, uh, from the advocacy, main advocacy page. Okay. Um, it is, is it contact or? It's not contact, but you know, the, the you were trying to get uh, Wikipedia to take an action and how do we, it might be other documentation, I don't know, you, you did such an awesome job reorganizing this page. I, I, <laughs> thank you. I'll look for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, what we, what we developed uh, was a little page that says, hey, this is how we work, this is how we're organized, uh, and these are some of the things we can do, some of the things we can't do, uh, in an attempt to sort of to, to educate and grow the awareness of our limitations and our strengths. Uh, because it's, like I said, it's been very frustrating to be seen as the central contact point when we're really not, you know, we don't steer the ship, right? There are a thousand flowers blooming, whether I like it or not. Uh, and to be clear, I love it, right? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, but, uh, you know, people don't realize, they look at us, we own the logo, we're the central website, so they think we must be able to do these things. And, uh, and I think we're trying to get mature now about, uh, about how we uh, do that. Ah, I think maybe under, no, that's not it. Well, <laughs> Um, uh, maybe I'll find it on my phone uh, when somebody else is uh, talking. But yeah, I mean that's one. Of the, we, we've been Rock trying guide for advocacy organizations. Ah, yeah, exactly. Asking Wikipedians to support advocacy because this is what happens. They email us and they say, "Hey, uh, can you just support cause X?" Right. And so we have to talk to them about how important is cause X to us. Sometimes it's very important. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's very important, but we don't feel we have a role. Right? This has been a constant um, uh, and frustrating issue around privacy, where we are deeply concerned about privacy. We've worked very hard, I think, in the past 18 months to improve our privacy situation. Uh, but at the same time, as a lobbying group, we don't have a special message. Right? Um, we are, in, in the privacy sense, we are another website. We're a very large website. Um, but we, we don't have anything special to say about privacy, merely that privacy is important. Whereas copyright, uh, we can say, not just do, are these copyright laws awful, we have this very unique to us story where we can you know, connect with people and say copyright is, is really important and here's how you're screwing it up, right? Um, and so we have to break it gently to the privacy folks that look, we want to be involved and we want to support, but there's only we have to steward our resources to focus on things like copyright where, where we have this unique value and story, right? So that's the other thing that I think is a lot of what we're focusing on right now. I guess there's these three things that we're focusing on right now, right? How do we build relationships both inbound and outbound uh, in such an amorphous, you know, broad movement? Uh, and how do we make sure it's the right people building the relationships, right? It doesn't make sense for me to be calling up the Italian government, right? So I need to, so we, we're still figuring out how that works, right? We need to figure out what the toolkits are. What are the answers other than blacking out the site? And we need to figure out what is it that the, what are the issues? Each world. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> but we can all that use it. I mean, so far we're batting, well, I guess the Russians lost when they blacked out the site. Um, that was a very frustrating, I don't know if any of you have followed, but the, uh, the Russian Wikipedia about a year and a half ago uh, blocked out uh, 
the Russian Wikipedia in response to a censorship law in Russia. And they did get a response from Parliament, and the response was, oh, no, no, don't worry, that won't apply to you. Which, of course, it took less than a year before it was applied to them, right? Um, uh, so so it's, that, it's those relationships, it's picking our issues, and it's picking the toolkit, right? And those are what I see as sort of our big challenges over the next year, is how do we, how do we develop in all those areas? So to maybe just quickly chime in here, um, we agreed that actually it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's also a huge advantage that we're this global community with a lot of individuals who are wearing a lot of different hats, uh, doing stuff and wanting to, to work with us. And um, now we're looking for, for a toolkit. Um, does anyone, also anyone in the audience, maybe have an idea or a proposal? What kind of tools can we create to sort of <coughs> empower this community that to lower, to lower the threshold for people to get active in a, in a policy process? I mean, we're, we're running an Adopt Your MEP campaign now, but um, things, things like that. Um, so if, um, does anybody have any idea on, on how to do that? Um, just propose it. So Cameron Allen, I'm the advocacy director at Common Collaborative Science, so thanks for coming um, And we've been doing a whole bunch of stuff in Europe, which is new for us um, over the last 12 months. You are the word from here. Yeah. 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 Get your microphone. <laughs> 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 um, I'm the advocacy director at Public Library Science, and thanks publisher. And we've been doing a bunch of stuff in Europe, which is new, new for us for the last 18 months. One thing, one strategy we found really successful, um, which talks to this sort of relationship building, is actually not logging. It's going to people and saying, here's a bunch of data. Here's, here's, here's a resource. Here's um, information about what this costs or who's reading it or what's going on. That's information you guys in this community have that's going to be much better than a lot of other places. So that thing, and then you become a resource and then these people come back to you. They, they ask for more information. Sometimes that's more information a lot. Um, but that's you're building that relationship by being a resource for them and a trusted resource. Um, that's, that's a really powerful way that we found that, that really, really allows us to build some quite important relationships pretty quickly. What kinds of issues are you guys uh, advocating on? <laughs> Besides the one we just worked on last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what we're, we're mainly focused on the implementation of the European Commission requirements for open access in Horizon 2020, the, the new funding program for research has been our main focus. Um, and the implementation is a mess um, in many ways um, because I haven't thought about the details of what's going to happen and how it's going to work. And it so happens that we have an awful lot of information about, you know, for instance, one question no one else could answer. Um, how many papers get published in open access journals where the paper is published after the end of the grant which means that people no longer have the funding to pay to make the article open access. That was an important question. It um, raises the question of how do you I mean, we happen to be able to be the only data set on that. It turns out the data set, which is, well, which is significant, but less than before. But, um, but really, the implementation details, um, less about the policy itself now that's in place, um, and then obviously copyright, um, licensing, and getting better money. Dennis Pamela, my background is a bit different. I've worked most of my life with environmental issues. But so one question I have is that a lot of power is now moving east, so the emerging countries. And lots of NGOs are very powerful in the English speaking countries, uh, specifically in the US. And, and those are becoming increasingly irrelevant in, in the international scene. So what China is talking about, what India is talking about, is becoming more relevant, more relevant in terms of WTO or, or you know, now it was just the new World Bank is being set up. While the environmental NGOs are very, you know, starting to understand that by just having a small chapter there, or starting to invest, and what you were sort of talking about 20 years later, and what I see is that the movement from with Wikipedia is really weak. Uh, it's very few people in emerging countries talking about these things. It's still very much a, a U.S. and then maybe a little bit of European issue, but very, very little is there. And I get so many questions about this that the next generation of issues is really about the kind of things we talk about here. But it's very little reflected there. So that's so. Then one question I have is: 
how, how are you thinking about that in terms of developing your next steps, um, developing economies? And the other one is also being referring to you, the good guys. I was a bit sort of surprised to see that Vicky, Peter Wikimedia was very low on Greenpeace, sort of ranking on how good they um, was on environment issues. So if you want to be seen as the good guys, um, how much are you also looking at into other issues? Gender environment, not because you're good at that, because your, your sort of status of being a good guy will be undermined or a woman, will be undermined by not addressing these issues. A challenge for all organizations because you know we don't have special capacity in those areas. But if we don't work there, we might run the risk of saying, oh, so Wikimedia is only run on cold power plants. Oh, how can you be so stupid that even the worst companies on the evil side are moving away from that? So that's our my two questions of emerging countries. And then how do you deal with their sort of credibility and branding issue of being a good guy uh, while not being sort of having the capacity to dive in and being an expert in this area? I mean, I can speak to those pretty quickly. I mean, the first one, you know, we know we have the problem of our strength and influence in the developing world is hardly limited to the advocacy part. And I see, um, you know, I mean, our, our relative presence in a lot of uh, a lot of these countries you listed is not what we would like to do, right? Uh, we spoke earlier today about what the zero is part of the answer to that. Um, but I think, look, our power as a movement come is is entirely grassroots, yes. right? Um, and and so if we are not um, both because of the community, but also because of the content, right? I mean, I can go and I can drop a bunch of lobbyists in. Wherever, whatever country it is, right? Um, but if if we are not, if our encyclopedia is, if our content is not strong in that language, no amount of lobbyists I can airdrop can can resolve that problem, right? And so I see those, uh, you know, it, it does impact advocacy, but I think ultimately the solution there is a long-term organic growth uh, plan from the bottom, up, right? That's that's what I see for for that for that question. And the second one. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, right? And, and I'm curious to hear what you guys have to think about it. But my immediate thought is, we have been thinking about how we husband our resources, right? Because the whole world wants a piece of us. And uh, and we don't want, uh, we've been trying very hard not to burn bridges when we say no, right? We try to say no super nicely. Um, and, uh, and that's, but I mean, shoot, I didn't even know that we said no to Greenpeace, apparently, right? Or, uh, you know, we not said no, no but, yeah. but... The way you act, the way you buy electricity. Right, yeah, and the thing is, I didn't even know that that was a thing, right? Um, and so it's, it's we're just, we're a global organization, and yet we're not, right? And, and that presents challenges simply in knowing some of these things, right? People expect us, it's part of the game for us is expectations management, because people think, oh, you're the fifth biggest website on earth. You must have all this knowledge and all these resources. And we're like, you know, I mean, we're the only organization in Silicon Valley that doesn't have like a relationship manager, right? So people are like, oh yeah, let me talk to your business dev guy. I, I don't know who's, who's my business dev guy. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so that kind of expectations management. We should be trying to do the right thing and all those things, but we're also just too young and too small in some ways relative to our global footprint to solve all the to solve all the problems, right? I mean, Though I definitely will talk to you afterwards about the details there. I mean you, you, you mentioned that you come uh, professionally from uh, from uh, I mean, I've been an environmentalist uh, scene. So I think you you guys are still uh, two decades ahead of us in terms of um, uh, professional advocacy. Um, and so I think uh, what's what's happening now is that the, the Movement is reaching out to to um, to NGOs to have at least um, some kind of common ground, a common interest, and it's really exciting what is happening in Brussels now because, of course, there's uh, I think just the, the Greenpeace uh, office. I think it's, uh, it's the biggest. We have like uh, like 12 person, but this is the relation um, in comparison to the industrial lobbies. We have like <laughs> 120 persons in the, in the, in the office. On the, other side of the road. So um, it's exciting to 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 uh, um, to, to uh, have um, a small unit of creative commons now in Brussels. or focus on Brussels. You know, um, yeah, maybe uh, we have uh, access, of, of course, and, and and many other initiatives to come. So I think this is 
um, a very uh, useful and very important step to do um, um, because the inside the Wikimedia universe there's a tendency to, to, to perceive yourself as some, something special and unique and of course there are some aspects, aspects which are really unique um, but on the other hand you can adopt some techniques and some experiences from other NGOs I think this is the task ahead of us to get learnings, learnings outside of our movement and to, uh, to, to adopt them. Somebody had a question back there And hi, my name is Fred Gellnett. I was uh, I worked in the British government for eight years, five years on digital projects for, um, on um, the DCMS. And I think you guys are positioning yourself wrong. You're sort of acting as a supplicant and saying, look, we have these things that we need from you. Can you please write legislation in this way? The, the thing that I've learned about government is they have no idea about the future. You know, every day the future hits them on the head. You guys are already living the future. So I have a motto for how you do with government. I say you solve the problem, they don't know they've got yet, because they're always looking backwards. So I just looked online, kind of what your demands are, I've just looked at, I don't know if people know the I-2020 program of the EU, so for example, that's got cultural diversity things in there. What you go to them and say, hey, you've got this program to deliver, well, actually, you can deliver it like this, and by giving it whatever it may be, like giving us resources or doing this project, you show how you deliver their problems for them, but you do it in a way that works for you. So I've done quite a lot of this on the back to come to Wikimedia UK and do some workshops and show you how to do that. Okay. Um, I would just want to, to say something. Uh, what I said before is that we are perceived as the good ones. And uh, uh, I think if, if it's true that we are not the good ones now. And uh, the fact is, you must, as a community member, make the envi environmental issue a thing. I think it's, it's important for, for, for other organizations to say, okay, Wikimedia, we love you, but we are doing this wrong. And you say, okay, okay. You know, I mean, as, as you say, we are entirely grassroots. There is the, the, this amazing thing that is the community that nobody knows what it is because it's a bunch of people that wants to talk about certain things sometimes, if they want, in weekends or at three at night. And so, <laughs> no, this is, this is the problem. Like, there is no, no one is in charge. <laughs> so you you want if you want to, 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 to put something on the table, you must do it yourself. And I think it's it's really important like to, to address certain topics as okay, you have many servers, like your footprint is huge, like please you know think about this. And uh, this is the only way to do that. And uh, one another thing is that as both then say we are really we are really, really young as an organization as organizations and as a, a, a movement and um, so we don't really know how to do some stuff and we actually we found Wikipedia you know it, I always think about Wikipedia as a sort of you know uh, as you say a chicken with golden eggs we, we we just had that in our hand it just was you know chicken eggs. Golden Age, and people were coming to our website. We actually changed the world without knowing that. And, uh, and so we said, okay, what we do with this? Like, we are really important. Uh, okay, and so we just <laughs> tore the egg somewhere. And uh, I think that we we can be bold on Wikipedia because Wikipedia is resistant and is resilient. <laughs> we have created, like, I don't know if it's Magnus, like the, the, the history thing that was genius, like, because we, can actually go back to every page in, in the history of the page, and so we can actually let people, let people, you know, you know, make mistakes. This was, you know, this is a technical thing that allowed a sort of spirit, like be bold, just do stuff. You don't have to ask permission, just do stuff. If you make a mistake, we can correct it. And I think this is really important because we do not have that, you know, in uh, in the real world. So if we, you know. If you say something political and uh, half the community say, no, you're wrong, you know, that's a problem for the communication staff. <laughs> and, uh, or the or, you know, Wikimedia Italy in, in a very much smaller proportion. So I think this is kind of kind of the reason we created something and you know in the digital world we created well. 
and it was a void and we filled that. And, but in the real world, that there are many, many things we are not doing and we are kind of cautious and we are, we are always not political. We always think, okay, just talk about access to knowledge and copyright and open access because, you know, it's access to knowledge, even if it's just color. So we always stay there. We could be more bold, but we need to know how, you know, we really have to have your, your spirit. So please, just. Uh, I was, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's not that we don't know, right? It's, um, I think, uh, I, well, no, 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 but I mean, uh, I, I mean, I mean, just in this room, much less the much broader community, we, we clearly have some knowledge, right? We've had some very bright people, you know, give us some, uh, the resources thing, uh, this is not the first time I've heard that, but it's, I think it's going to be super huge for us, right? And where have we heard it from? We haven't heard it from, we, we've, we've heard it when we've gone and asked, right? And, um, and I think it's funny, we're so good at a movement at creating collective knowledge when it comes to the encyclopedia. And we're pretty <laughs> bad at, um, and so we've got this collective knowledge out there, right? Like we've got people in this room, we've got people on mailing lists, they know and would be happy to help, right? Every time I ask any other person, hey, how do I do this? Like, I, you know, I, I learned tons of things, right? Um, and, but then, you know, I'll be the first to say, I'm not good at then putting it in the wiki, right? I'm not good at, getting it written down so that you, so that the next time you say, hey, how do I do this? Instead of me saying like, well, Danny told me <laughs> something a year ago, but I don't remember exactly, right? It would be much better if I could point at the wiki and say, you know, I mean, I would, I would take, well, I don't know, would I, Danny, should I take your name off of it when you give me wisdom? No, I was just gonna say, what actually should happen is we should write it down, preferably in Wikipedia, right? Like, we should, we should be thinking in much. The encyclopedia of lobbying? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we just have to think about some lobbying. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I mean, that, that's actually a genuine, that's a genuine, part of the genuine problem, right? Like, we certainly see, uh, so we just worked with Public Library of Science on a letter uh, about uh, open access licensing. We published a blog post yesterday, so nobody read it because it was during the Romanian, but it was a very nice blog post. And, uh, and the open and the FLOSS folks and, and some others uh, at Open Knowledge you know, did a great job leading that. But it was frustrating for me because I knew about it and I couldn't really talk to, you know, the letter was embargoed, right? We didn't, and so, and so it was very difficult for us to, to share. And so I started talking about the issue generally on a mailing list to get some feedback and I got some useful feedback, but it was limited because I couldn't say, oh, by the way, here's the, you know, here's the letter, tell me what you think, right? And so that's a, that's a real big and genuine challenge for us, right? And I don't, I mean, I think we're still learning a little bit about how do we have trusted, you know, Dini's been good about building a small core group of trusted people, but we want to make that, I mean, it would be great if we could make that a much, much broader group, we just, doing that is hard, right? I mean, how do we get, how do we get, there's like, it's a public version of the lobbying encyclopedia, and here's the one with like, where the top page has all the dark parts, right? <laughs> Buried in the top page. <laughs> um, one question I would like to address is um, when you have a liquid structure, um, conflicts are bound to happen at some point. And then we've spoken maybe um, the, the, the most um, the important resource we have is actually our brand, our name. Um, and in order to preserve that, it's important to not really have, um, well, let's call them shitstorms in public. Uh, <laughs> um, and for this, I mean, we, we have no um, rigid hierarchical structure, that's why it's liquid, but how important would it be to have somebody who is allowed to call the shots? Um, do you think that's something very important, or can we do it that? Um, uh, you, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's, it's funny because, uh, I mean, essentially, the, the weird thing about EFF is that we're, um, we work and are part of lots of open institutions, and yet um, we're, we're a part of author, which is to say that we do a lot of stuff that, that is by its very nature confidential, um, and we have like, these closed attorney-client privileges with, with the, the, the um, uh, defendants. So um, 
we, we get in some ways the advantage of, of making these very sort of um, closed decision processes. Um, and I would say that, that you know, we, that it's very clear to us that one of the consequences of being open is that you do get to expose your shitstorms in public. Um, but that's something that provides you your, with your strength, too. Um, and I sort of feel like this is something that will gradually, uh, uh, the world will adjust to the fact that there are institutions that exist in the world where you can see every single deliberation that's going on. So that those, those things can't be extracted so much out of their context without people going, yeah, but like, I, that happens everywhere. That's not, that's not as big a deal. Um, this is a hope I've had for a very long time. Um, but, but, you know, I actually do feel that things are getting better in that sense. And I think that it's absolutely poisonous to a open, distributed, decentralized organization to try and get around those minor negative effects by going, okay, let's close off part of it and, and make the real decisions here. Um, because you, you lose everything else or the other benefits. How do we best explain that to our peer organizations? Because this you is mean, literally right. a question I face at least once a month. Somebody comes to me with an embargo letter right. that would be, you know, that I feel very confident 90% of the community would support. Right. Uh, how do I explain it? Because I'd love to be able to like have a magic phrase that I drop on them that makes them say, oh yeah, sure, you guys can violate the embargo, it's fine. Yeah. Right. Like I and I don't. I have no idea. Is there any way we can do that? I think the answer is no. But I'd love to. I. I you know. I, it's funny to watch embargoes slowly disappear from the world. And I don't think they've disappeared from the NGO world. But I've watched them disappear from the publishing, the press, the news world. In the you know we we don't embargo stuff anymore. I mean I mean I don't think we ever did that much. But you know the closest that happens is that we maybe like some particular journalist will want to write about something. And so we'll say, okay, well, you know, we'll talk, just talk to you. But if someone else found it, it wouldn't be our fault, right? That would just be something that happened. Um, so this is, I, I think, part of the world just evolving to deal with open institutions. And the problem is, is that, of course, politics is full of secrets and full of timing, and full of people wanting to hoard information as, as, as a power. As, as, as an opportunity to, to, to do powerful things. And the fact of the matter is, is that's ethically opposed to what Wikipedia and organizations like Wikipedia represent. The nice thing is, is that now we're in a position where we're kind of sufficiently power, uh, powerful to go, if you don't want to deal with it in that way, then you can't deal with it. Uh, then deal with someone else. It's, it's situations like, for instance, when I watch Mozilla, kind of have to enter into relationships with um, telephone carriers to do the Firefox OS firm. And you can see the real struggle that that organization had to deal with the fact that they were signing NDAs and working out on, on hardware and software when their whole institution was based around the idea of doing that openly in public. And I think it was very, um, I think it was a real challenge for them. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, one of the ways you can learn how to do this is watching other other open institutions. Yeah. When I, I I was at Mozilla for a year, and when I joined, uh, the hard bright line rule was no NDAs. Right. And the, I, I suspect, not having been in their legal department for some time, that the rule is no longer no NDAs, but it is still there. Be a better be a damn good reason. Right. Right. Can, this is something I would sort of like to ask the audience and, and building a little bit um, on this question both of, of control of information and of decision making. Uh, there's, there's not just this problem of embargoes of, uh, of saying, well, you can't share the information. There's also this question of you have to make a decision by day X, right? Uh, those of you who are active Wikipedians will know that deadlines are not something we are good at, right? <laughs> and um, and so I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts uh, in your you know much longer than my experience as a Wikipedian, 
how do we, when, a, when another organization comes to us and says, uh, hey, the deadline is X, how can we, I mean, part of it, obviously, obviously our first answer is, hey, we'll see what we can do, but we're not great at deadlines, so, you know, don't take it personally, right? Like, that's, that's, our, that's our stock response. But I'm wondering if you all have ideas about how we can sort of meet in the middle with these groups, right? How do we meld our consensus building process, which may take, in the worst case scenario, an infinite amount of time, <laughs> how, how, do, how do we meld that with, uh, with the needs, with the, the real, genuine, real world needs of the advocacy process, the legislative process, you know? Any, any thoughts you all have on, on how we bridge that gap? Okay, if anybody wants to answer that, <laughs> then after that we have Jan and then somebody from the audience wanted to ask something. So go. Well, I, I think this is a, a, an organizational issue for everyone that is grassroots based. And, and you have that very much in the NGOs sector. Green is very quickly because they're sent through the control, there's no saying on, you know, if you, you pay, and that's it. So I think you have a very strong position saying we really engage in long term issues where there's time for the constituency to be able. Uh, I'm very sorry, that's not that far of being you know, quick on your feet, small things. And that's usually incremental things anyway. Uh, and you can leave that to other people to do that. And maybe do a scan and say, where do we need that kind of action? But we can't do that. We need to allow ourselves to work more, maybe like the Oxfam's or like the, um, the Friends of the Earth, who have longer time because they want to be grassroots based. And I think that's a very good thing for transparency long term also, to send that signals into other organizations. Because the three ones that win some of these things are the big corporations. Because they are strong, they're non democratic, non transparent. They love these things. And the thing is, what they do is you should try to do is play the game of those corporations. And they might win on the margin. But what you are doing is so much more important. You can set the agenda and be transparent. And that was also forcing it back to the policymakers and saying, sorry, you didn't get the input for the India or the Foundation because you took things too quickly. You must allow, through democratic reasons, people to get the voice heard. So I think that's a very powerful message to get back. It will be uncomfortable for the organizations asking you in, in, the, in, the, in the short term, but on the long term, in five years' time, I think you have lots to gain from sending that message back. Sorry for the conflict. Is this a direct answer to that, or? Well, I just wanted to ask for some other answers. So, uh, how did how did you, how did you decide to stand against the um, right to be, right to be forgiven? That is that is one of the kind of example for advocating for something. So I, I was uh, I, I'm asking about that process. How did you decide to do that? I, I can 
had gotten uh, one request, and so we had planned to do this in a very gradual, wiki-ish kind of way, right? And then in the space of five days, we got five requests. And it happened in a week before Wikimania when we knew we would have a very unusual opportunity to get our message out, right? And so we were faced with this difficult internal choice of the outside world has imposed a deadline on us, just as I was talking about uh, right before Catherine came in. Uh, and, you know, and, and making that decision, right? Um, so I think that, I, I hope that what we'll see now, uh, I think we're already seeing some of it on the advocacy advisors list for those of you who are there, uh, and certainly in the hallway conversations here. Is everybody still hearing me over there? Uh, I'm seeing, oh, all right, I'm seeing some thumbs up in the back, all right. Um, uh, and now, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you know, I mean, that's just part of our, our learning and growing experience is how do we, what are those processes internally, right? We, I don't think we've ever faced a situation like this where we were hit with this double whammy of things going from a slow burn to a big crisis because we're literally getting one every day combined with this unique opportunity um, you know, that we've never faced that before, right? We're still learning how to deal with that kind of thing, right? And I, I think I think we still have to figure out some of the processes of how we discuss some of these things. And we may, I mean, as, right before you came in, um, the thoughtful gentleman here from Greenpeace, is, or from the environmental movement, whose name I, I, is escaping me at the moment, was saying that one of the things we may need to think about is that some opportunities we're just gonna have to pass on, right? And we're, but we're still learning what those are, right? Yeah, I mean, we made that decision so fast and with such, uh, I mean, obviously a tremendous amount of thought. I don't think we slept for five days. Um, but at the same time, you know, there were all these questions that we had about when do we notify the advocacy advisors list that we're talking about this? How do we deal with this in terms of communicating this to the to the, to the folks in the movement? Are, are people going to agree with what we're saying? I mean, we think we're pretty clear on, on what we're saying, but there's, there's other considerations, and so there's a lot to learn, um, and I think we will be learning, and I completely agree, but we'll have to pass on certain opportunities, and that's that's really okay, because it is about the long-term benefit, it's not, not the short-term advice. So yeah. who was it that made the decision, and how was it made? It was made by our, the executive director to move forward. <coughs> we had a conversation about it at a uh, legal and communications level, and then went to the executive director with saying, these are the pros, these are the cons, these are the opportunities, these are the risks, and Lila said, I think this is an incredibly important issue. I think it's an existential issue, and I think we should move forward. And yeah, I, I, let, me, let me add one thing. This is a recurring theme, and I, I want to just throw, or a recurring theme that I am hearing in the room that I want to throw out there for everybody to think about as we continue all these other discussions. A recurring theme I'm hearing is that there are certain key issues, particularly copyright, where there's already a strong consensus and that enables us to act in a radically different uh, manner than areas where there's, uh, where either they're like very new areas, like uh, like this particular, uh, you know, this particular ECJ ruling, um, or areas where there's simply less consensus about is it core to us, like the like the privacy issues, right? And it feels like there's a, a huge gulf, and I don't know how to define it, right? But once an issue crosses over into this area where we've got core consensus, we are the, the, the problems uh, we face and the tools we have to address them are just, it's like a whole different world relative to some of those other issues, right? I think, uh, I think uh, Perhaps to the, to the microphone, would that help? Like everybody well, wants to talk about this kind of here. Wikipedia has a huge reputation. Unfortunately, there's nothing easier than this, to destroy a yeah. big reputation. You know? Keeps me up at night. I'm afraid that that's my opinion. That uh, I'm afraid I'm that my mind. Wikipedia has a huge reputation. Unfortunately, it's very easy to destroy. Uh, I my opinion is that uh, following some uh, uh, some agenda of some NGO might be an ideal way to. Stories. Because then people will think, uh, okay, this stuff has an agenda, should I contribute to it? Uh, or this may buy us for the contribution to, okay, support this agenda. It's a very delicate thing. I think that, uh, in my opinion, Wikipedia has done a wonderful job in doing what it does to connect the, 
that's that has I think slowed and, and sometimes stopped our action in that area, right? Uh, which may or may not may in some ways be a bad thing, but sometimes a good thing. One of the things to emphasize is that the discussion that goes on within the Wikipedia community is often one of the things that sort of defines the position for a lot of other people too. In the uh, in copyright and with things like the right to be forgotten. Um, no, you know, th this is something, the right to be forgotten is something that's only happened because of this ECJ decision in this particular time. And everybody's been sort of struggling to understand how they should do <coughs> that. And, um, you know, I, I, my, my position on this shifts every time I read somebody who I respect um, talk about it and, you know, it refines. And I think one, one of the scary things about working at the EFF is that you suddenly realize that, you know, you're so used to looking to other people to decide, okay, well, what should I think about this? <laughs> um, uh, and then you suddenly realize that lots of other people are looking at you to come up with, like, the position that, that, that people should assume. Not because, you know, they're, they're zombies, but just because they, they don't have enough hours in the week and they want somebody else to think about this and that's what they pay you Bitcoin's all. Um, so, so, uh, and so it's been a real struggle to understand like all the ramifications of this. And one of the communities that I'm really interested to know how to think about this is is the Wikipedia community. And uh, you know, part of that is seeing how the, the the organization as a whole reacts. But also, it's the discussion internally, I think, and how the you know how. I, honestly, the thing that interests me most is actually what the procedure will be, because I've had a certain amount of, of, of battles with Google and with the Article 29 working group about how this should be implemented, because you know, I, was, I was literally staying up last night thinking, well, if they did it like this, maybe it would work, right? Maybe it would be <coughs> acceptable if it was maybe an algorithmic shift rather than just removing it from the, the search engine's index. Maybe that would be an acceptable thing to do. And of course, Google is, is just ad-libbing and improvising through this as much as anybody else, and so, frankly, are the data protection people. Nobody knows how to do this. And, and, yeah, and, and Wikipedia is one of those people that may be able to innovate a solution to this. Thanks a um, I worked on uh, the relation plan of in the European Parliament. I would like to talk about this issue of the brand and being the good guys. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about Wikipedia Zero in the net neutrality debate, and Wikipedia Zero is setting one of these examples where um, it's easy to use, for example, for Facebook to point out where how zero rating can be a good thing and how uh, giving people access to, to certain services without charge. Uh, can be like that, and also uh, in the political debate, uh, the zero here is more strengthening the position of uh, big monopolies um, in Silicon Valley and in the telecoms industry. And um, my, my question is also, um, when, when you look at the blog post that was uh, released uh, recently, I mean, there was a lot of debate, uh, which was not really conclusive also on the advocacy this about Wikipedia Zero. And, uh, the consensus on the list was more or less don't go ahead with that. We don't have a clear position. But still, um, the blog post was released. Um, there is now a media position um, that they are backing this project and also some criticism on net neutrality legislation. And uh, the blog post that was released today by the NGOS is now um, ties that the media is basically turning its back on the open internet. Um, so my question is, uh, isn't this a big problem for Wikipedia also at the point that, um, in a sense, Wikipedia is destroying the, the very fundamental openness which allowed a project like Wikipedia to be successful in the first place. You mentioned the Encyclopedia Britannica would have had a zero rated service in the early days of Wikipedia, maybe that, that project never would have come into its current form. So I actually, I, I want to avoid answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, do that subtly. <laughs> but no, no, I'm, I'm going to do it very bluntly. But I'm going to do it because I think, um, I mean, A, we could have an all afternoon discussion. I mean, I, I, I hear your concerns. I think they're very genuine. Um, and, I, and I share some of them myself. Um, but I think it is more interesting for the purposes of this uh, discussion to talk about to, to bring back the question again
again to how do we make this how do we make decisions about difficult questions like this one right and I uh, and I again I turn it back to to you guys how do you think we should given that you know we do Wikipedia is a race of concerns it was just on rules by the foundation I,
soda stuff from the sidelines, just like a lot of other people, obviously cheering and excited. Um, uh, but I think we're very conscious within the organization that that is the history, right? That we, that the first question we ask is how central is this, right? Is this going to be, um, and that's where something that again plays into how challenging the net neutrality issue is for us. It's hard because we deeply believe that um, making Wikipedia accessible um, to people all over the world is, is you know, very fundamental to who we are. And, uh, and, and if it were of any less fundamental to who we are, this would be easy, right? Um, we we go home. Uh, but, but instead it is, uh, you know, instead we feel very deeply that it's that crucial and critical, and, and that's what makes it so hard. Well, um, we're slowly running out of time, so anybody wants to make a final round of comments, so we have five minutes otherwise. Danny, you've been most erudite so far. <laughs> Me? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, thanks. I can't think of an introduction more likely to make me incoherent. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, I, 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 the thing that I come away thinking about this is, you know, the hardest part of this is that advocacy and having positions of, of, of an organization like Wikipedia isn't like having a Wikipedia page, right? That the, we have to spend so much of our, our time explaining to everybody else, look, it doesn't matter what it says right now, because we can just revert it and edit it. And it's the process that's important. And obviously, whenever you lobby or take a position, that's sort of weirdly frozen in time and suddenly becomes something that you have to stand behind. And it's very hard to just suddenly go, oh, we changed their mind again. Or actually, here are two blog posts. Um, <laughs> opposing positions, you can just pick the one that you like. Um, and that kind of uh, impotence mismatch is sort of a, a real challenge for, for any institution that works in the collective way that Wikipedia does. I think really the only thing that you can try and do is to make the two things as close to one another as they can be. I think one of those things means developing a way to be both forceful about things, but tentative. You know, if that idea of strong ideas weakly held. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I think that's possible, right? I, I think like, one of the things that's fascinating to me about um, uh, Wikipedia Zero is that EFF wrote a blog post saying, oh, we're not sure about whether Wikipedia Zero fits with network neutrality. And we actually sort of, and we, it. we did, right? <laughs> we did it, because we were there. It came out, and we went, no, that's not quite what we meant. Um, but, but it's really hard for both EFF and Wikipedia, because with the names now, to say something in a tentative way. And I think we should work to an environment where we can do that. Right, that we can actually convey with our positions the multiplicity of the, of the, the, of the voices that make up that. Um, I would like it that lobbying actually was a lot more like that. And in fact, the closer you get to the positions of power, the closer it gets like that. And um, uh, I think maybe the thing that we can bring and innovate into this space is rather than just going, this is our position, and if we're wrong, we're still going to continue that position. Um, and more like actually having a conversation in the hallways of power, because that's the point. what we've developed here is that having a conversation that comes up with a concrete result in the end. So, that's <laughs>
to do something else with the data retention regulation coming up in Europe. So why not exchange ideas with no given result? Why not have a radical open deliberation which reflects our thoughts and our disagreement? But it in the end it could inspire some of the